Hello and welcome to another episode of the Sharp Talk Podcast. I'm Tom, aka Tom Hosting Outdoors on YouTube and Instagram, and today I'm joined with my only co-host, Alex, who is Alex's Knifebox on YouTube and at Alex underscore Knifebox on Instagram. Woo! So hello, Alex. Welcome back to another episode. I think this is 21 for us. Oh, uh, yeah. It's uh, it's been a journey so far, but we're not alone because I got my good friend Creek Knob with me right now. Creek Knob, have you have you had too much to drink already? Nope, it's my first sip, but hopefully it'll be too much by the time we're done. No, I meant because it's Knob Creek, not Creek Knob. Oh, Nut Creek, Nut Creek, N- what? Knob Creek. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyhow. whatever. Anyhow, uh, Creek as- Knob Creek. Creek knob knob the creek. Same shit. Anyhow, as always, um, I know that you probably got something cool in your pocket today, right? Uh, depends who you ask. I'm asking you. So, so do you think it's cool or? It's a bare knuckle. Kershaw bare knuckle. Cool? Kershaw bare knuckle seven 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 seven. <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, I think this knife is really cool. Um, I decided to go simple today and, uh, but yeah, I got the bare knuckle today. It's relatively a pretty cool knife because it's very light and, uh, the blade shape does have that, you know, the triple seven esque to it. Uh, but with that little bit of a swoop down on the tip, it's kind of a nice, useful EDC knife and it's a lot of blade. I mean, it's, you can see compared to my hand, it's it's a large blade. Yeah. So, and of course, it's got that feature of the beautiful subframe lock design that Kershaw and uh, Microtech love to fight over. So, uh, <laughs> but this one is actually for sale uh, for fifty bucks. Whoever wants it, I I may have sold it. Yeah, I'm not sure. Whoever's got the money first. But I ended up uh, liking the knife so much, I bought the twenty CV. Uh, exclusive version from Smoking on Night Forks. I saw that on your Instagram today. I was reading your post right before we got on here. Yeah. So, right. I actually have a, a new knife in the pocket today. I bought it not too long ago, and that is a 940-1. Cool. And we'll get to um, why I bought this when we get up to the new acquisitions portion of this, because I have something else special with me today. I'm going to blow it right now and probably say it has something to do with uh, transparent knives. It does. That it does. <laughs> How did I know? I got I got a proto in my hand. Yes. All right. I, I was doing some testing for him. All right. That's awesome, man. We'll so, talk do you, more about that. so do you want me to go ahead with my new or the, the new acquisitions technically because I know that you got a hell of a list? Yeah, man. Let's talk about this project with uh, Brian. So Brian from Transparent Knives, we've had him on here as a guest before. Um, he's actually kind of sort of blowing up. He's not my little secret anymore, offering cheap regrinds and stuff. Um, his books are actually getting super busy. But he's been working on this reblading project for uh, the 940. And um, the blade was actually designed by Parsons Blade Works, who is um, he's part of the, the Reddit Discord that, that I'm a part of as well as Brian. And um, just... Basically, I saw this 940 reblade, and I was like, "Dude, I have to, I have to get one of those." So he's he's doing his own heat treating. He's starting to get into his own heat treating. He's bought a really nice even even heat oven, I think, is what they're called. That's so, the best one on the market. Man. Yeah, they're like a couple grand. Um, yeah. He's getting into heat treating, so he did. This is one of his own heat treat protocols, and he wanted me to test it. But this is what we got today. This is his uh, reblade oh, design. Yeah. That is wild, man. With a spider go opening hole. It's got a little bit of a swedge up front. I don't know if you guys can see if we can get the camera to focus a little bit better on it. There we go. But this, the blade was designed by Parsons Blade Works, and he did an excellent job on it. Uh, The cool thing about this thing, though, if you take a look compared to the normal 940, so the normal 940 where the jimping stops, you kind of have a a drop down to the blade. Whereas on his... It's just, it's just a, like a continuation. What does that thing look like when it's closed? Actually, it's not too bad. That looks cool. 
I really, really dig it. So you can actually Spidey flick it. This is a very, very rough prototype, he said. He didn't do a whole lot of uh, fit and finish work on it. It's mainly just for steel testing, uh, just what to test steel? the protocol. What steel did he put on there? So this is uh, 204P. And 204P? Yeah. So this heat treat protocol, he didn't have it hardness tested. He, he actually sent uh, like a little block that he heat treated the same way to Kurt. And it tests out at 62, but we're not totally sure where this one tested out at, because um, it hasn't. He has a hardness tester coming as well, so we can do all that in house I was again. Say that <laughs> he said it was taking too long to get knives back from Kurt. Yeah, and he's like, I don't want to wait a few days. He's like, I just want to do it now. So he just bought a uh, HRC tester. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll talk about him a little bit more later. Uh, but anyhow, I'm very excited for that. I did the, some cardboard cut, te cardboard cutting testing for him and the results were good, but not great. And, and like they were acceptable to me for, for what 204P or M390, any of that would be. He goes, yeah, it's not good enough. We're going back to the drawing board. I'm like, all right, man, you, you do you. I, I'm totally, totally down for you to improve on that. Yeah. You know, I, I'm a big fan of Brian and I, that was pretty cool. You brought him on because ever since me and him chat every once in a while, and um, I really like the guy. I mean, he seems to really want to be striving for the best job that he could possibly do. So if you guys haven't checked out Brian from uh, Transparent Knives, you guys need to go check him out. Easiest way to find him is on Instagram under Transparent Knives. And you'll see a lot of really cool projects. Anything from uh, Benchmade, uh, what is it, the... Uh, he just bug out regrinds. He's, yeah, bug he's, out regrinds, he's been doing right? a ton of regrinds. I mean, and he makes fixed blades, whatever you guys want. I think Brian can kind of cater to you guys. He's a cool dude, very easy to talk to, uh, responds really fast, and his pricing is very fair. So. Uh, Tab620 was asking about the how much it cost. Don't quote me on it, but I think that the prices that he was saying was like right around $180 for the blade, which really isn't crazy. Um, I That's why I bought a 940, by the way, was f for – a surrogate for the the project uh with his reblades very cool and i had to go balls to the wall and get the 940-1 because i mean why would i just get the base model right well if you're going to reblade it why why get the 940-1 because i wanted to do a lot of testing on s90v before the reblade got here got it got so it. Huh? so he huh? said it was about 185 dollars or so i'm not sure how many spots he has left because he's doing a limited run of like 20 of them for right now um i think 20 either 15 were for the general public and five were for youtubers i think i'm pretty sure that's how he split it up uh you'd have to check out his instagram to, to figure that out yeah i'm still uh brian is uh, actually waiting on his uh, hrc tester before he uh gives me my knife back but he's reblading my pilar nice so that's the reblade project i have going on with him originally we did a regrind on the uh pilar with the s35 vn uh, but we didn't really, you know, after it was done, we didn't really like the way it came out. So ended up being, he's like, why don't I just reblade it for you? So uh, he did already make a prototype blade that looked freaking amazing. Um, but he wants to do a little bit of heat treat and steel testing. I'm like, I was telling him, I'm like, dude, it's a Tylar, man. And that <laughs> shit could be at 56 HRC, who cares? Yeah. Well, knife, you know, it's not. You know, but he no, he insisted. He's like, no, we're gonna put some really good stuff on there, and I want to get it where I nail down the heat treat. So I'm like, go ahead and knock yourself out, man. Dave, so it should be fun. He's killing it right now, man. I, I love yeah. Brian. I love talking to Brian. He's always striving to learn more. And yeah, that's exactly what you want. You don't want a maker that's, you know, my way is the best way, and that's the only way I'm gonna do it. He's always trying to get better. I know. I still need to go drive up to go see him because he's only like maybe like half hour, 40 minutes from me. Yeah, I forgot that you you guys are pretty close. Yeah, actually, I went to high school in the town that he lives in. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah. I actually have a little uh, custom fixed blade coming for him. It's a new pattern uh, called the Guppy. Yeah. And it was supposed to be an LC200N, but from his old heat treater, it got kind of botched. And, yeah. Um, so he upgraded me to Vanax for free, and that's a heat, uh, Peter's heat treat on that one, too. So I'm really excited. Wow. Very excited for that one. That's pretty sick, man. Very cool. So well, what do we have new? So we're going to go into new acquisitions. 
Well, before I, I, I'm going to kick it off because I wasn't carrying this in the pocket today, but I thought I'd bring this out for the viewers to take a look. Uh, <coughs> my Sharp by Design Dagger did finally show up. Oh. I know you've seen it already. So um, right now, uh, you're looking at the Uranium Raffir Noble. I don't have a flashlight to make it glow, but it, it glows in the dark. It's the uh, same on both sides, kind of like a bolster lock design. Um, and if you listen to the action on this thing, it's super smooth. He's got, um, you can, uh, it's going to be hard to pick up on camera, but he actually has little mill pattern all over the blade. Oh my God. This thing is just like detail, like from butt to head. It's, it's wild. Uh, it does take a few shakes to close it. Yeah, he, he's never been about the whole drop shot stuff, and and then are you are you going off that one comment that he had? On yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, I'll tell you right now, this thing is butter smooth, and I mean, you you see it deploy, it's just it's wild, man. Is this your first uh, instance of handling a sharp by design? Uh, no, I've handled a few of them before, but uh, the dagger is just like it's something else all on its own. Like that, that is just like. Wow, is all yeah. I can see. I was going to ask you what you thought about the D10, if that was your first time handling it. No, I mean, I've handled them before. Uh, the D10 is, I mean, even if I, that's me trying not to deploy it, like trying to misfire it, right, when you try to put light pressure on it. Right. So and that's as close as I can get. I, I, I was more meaning it, like his little D10 nub, how it just, it's just a totally different feel. It does have a different feel to it. Um, and the knife, I, I've noticed when, when he really made the knife, he just kind of like made everything so detailed all the way to the fuller, to the milling pattern on the blade. Um, it's got a mirror polish on, on both sides of the edge, it, which is razor sharp. Um, I mean, everything that he, Brian touched on this knife, like he didn't leave anything undone. Like everything is so detailed to it. So I'm 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 incredibly uh, impressed with the level of craftsmanship that Brian put into this, um, and then the the Raffir Noble material that I gave him, he was a little nervous about using it, so I did send him some green fat carbon in case that wasn't going to work out, but he was able to make it work, you know, and uh, it's not a material he's used to using, and it came out perfect. I mean, now this is like a one of a kind. And it doesn't look like he mirror polished it like a lot of people do. It looks like he bead blasted over it, and it kind of has like a matte finish to it. Yeah, my mine's got a uh, it's it's a stone wash is what it is. Okay, gotcha. It's a very nice, clean stone wash, and I like it because you can see it kind of gives the blade a lot of depth. Yeah, it plays in the light a lot. So, um, I was thinking about having him do the the hand rub satin, but it was literally going to be another couple hundred dollars and the knife was already close enough to two grand as it was <laughs> <laughs> so so that's a new acquisition absolutely worth it though that, that thing's phenomenal yep um fernando medina and i are still uh working together my knife is probably about like 50 60 percent finished um so i'm still waiting for that custom hellcat uh, it's with some legit Westinghouse micarta and some zirconium. Uh, it should be a nice tuxedo-looking kind of custom knife. And with uh, Razor Damascus uh, blade from uh, from Vegas Forge. So it should be pretty cool. Very nice. Um, I did acquire a another uh, Spyderco military in Rex 45. I saw that. <laughs> so yeah i mean i i do youtube videos in the size comparisons i always use the para 3 and the pm2 so i figured i should have a military uh but because i couldn't really leave it alone i reordered blue custom uh, uh screws for it a black deep carry pocket clip and i got uh scales from uh aramis mm -hmm. Making uh, so he's gonna make them. Well, he already made them. They're in the mail. It's uh, Arctic uh, 
What's that shit? It's like a white and blue Arctic uh, something uh, Arctic, fat carbon. Arctic storm. Yeah, something like that. The fat carbon yeah. in Arctic, whatever they call it. Um, speaking of Arctic carbon fiber from fat carbon, I also noticed that Trevor Berger on Thanksgiving Day released a ten uh, knife. Ten. He's making ten uh, LEXK CFLs in uh fat carbon whatever color you wanted so i got the art yeah i got the arctic one i was one of those 10 people that was lucky enough to get on and what's funny is (laughs) you know what's funny is i i put comments like i'll take one in the comments it was like 30 people down i wasn't even like one of the first 10 Mm -hmm. but what ended up happening i think what so a lot of makers when you order a custom knife they say, okay, I'm going to make the knife, and then I'll contact you when the knife is finished. Then you send me payment. I'll send you the knife. Well, Trevor Burger doesn't work that way. Trevor Burger requires you to put 50% down. So I think people were like, oh, oh, never mind, you know, <laughs> and I ended up getting one of the 10. So that's cool. So, um, I don't know. If I had the opportunity to do that, I, I don't care how I was going to pay for it, credit card, whatever. I'd put a half payment down. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people are trading specters for those things. I want so, one. And they don't go for crazy prices secondary sometimes. Sometimes you get you get lucky. Yeah. Um, but if you're if the LXK CFL is his top notch model, um, I ended up going with the Warncliffe blade with it with a satin finish. Nice. And um uh, I'm I'm kind of looking forward to it. Um, and I will definitely trade it for a Spectre. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. So, um, also speaking of custom carbon fibers, because I've been on a crazy custom carbon fiber craze, I did buy some carbon fiber uh, from Carpo Plate in that blue marble carbon fiber that they have. And uh, it's getting shipped over to uh, Andrew Demko. And uh, I sent my AD15 in for him to uh, make some scales out of it. So it'll be kind of like a one-off, which is kind of cool. For once, I bought a fixed blade, Tom. Did you really? Yeah, I bought another fixed blade. I bought an Aaron Goff Resolute MK3. So if you guys aren't familiar with Aaron Goff, you guys got to check him out. His last name is spelled G O U G H. Aaron Goff makes an incredible knife. He's from Canada. He does use some CNC machinery, but the knife is pretty much all finished by hand. And um, very nice guy, very cool dude. And uh, people have been saying that his custom heat treat is something else. It's an A2 steel. Um, but a lot of people who are, it's meant for outdoors and, uh, people are just raving about how the steel performs. So I'm pretty curious. Um, we're not even halfway there guys. Yeah. He showed me the <laughs> list before we started. It was a long list. Uh, let's see what else, what else? Oh my, I sent my, uh, so I got a JD Vandeventer EDC front flipper that I've had for a little bit. And because they had a polished uh, titanium frame, I, I sent it to JD to uh, re-pimp it out. So it's getting pimped right now. Um, so that should be coming back to me pretty soon. Um, the bare knuckle and 20 CV. Um, the Praetorian. So I don't want to really blast Medford knives. But I think this is an objective kind of podcast. So I had bought a Medford Praetorian G. Um, I want to say maybe four years ago I bought this thing. And I had a crazy Vulcan finish. You guys can check it out on my Instagram. And as I showed Tom, when I finally decided to take this thing out of the box, and I'm like, fuck it, I'm going to start using it. <laughs> <clears throat> I started stropping it and I noticed that the blade was warped. So I reached out to Medford Knife and Tool 
and Mrs. Medford uh, does all the customer service and um, she contacted me back. I told her what kind of happened. I showed her some pictures and she said from time to time when they did the Vulcan finish, um, they would do that to a few blades. So at first she kind of tried to talk me into keeping the knife because it's got a beautiful finish just the way it is. And I told her, "Uh uh-uh, I just can't do a warp blade. I'm sorry. So uh, she, they offered actually to either reblade the knife um, or see if they can fix it. Now the catch twenty two is that they do know they do not do the Vulcan finish anymore. Mm. That's fine. So what we agreed upon trying to do is that I'm going to send them back the knife. They're going to grind the flats, not the flats. I'm sorry. They're going to grind the um, the hollow part of the grind and leave the flats in the Vulcan finish. And they're going to try to kind of make it like a dual finish kind of knife. That'd be cool. Yeah, they said they've done a few that way before. So we'll see how that turns out. Um, We already talked about Brian reblading my pilar. Yep. And then um, also, um, I'm a Balisong fan. So on the Black Friday deals, I noticed that Benchmade is discontinuing the uh, the 63 and the 67. So I jumped on the 63 and I, I got it for like 260 bucks or something like that. So that's the one with the Bowie blade. And then I also got the, uh, the Real Steel Metamorphous G5 in the Blade HQ exclusive with M390. I carried that around a little bit. It's cool. It's a cool little knife. And last but not least, actually, I take that back. There's two more. <laughs> the Sera- I, I got a Seraphim front flipper Yakuza, which is a Russian custom knife maker. Um, so I'll show that off when I get it. That's on its way from Russia, so I'll probably will see it next year. <laughs> uh, um and then the last one I got was the GEC 83 oil slick. Uh, was it the um, the oil slick pattern wood? Yeah. Or the the oil su- <laughs> yeah whatever uh, pattern 83 wood. Pattern <laughs> <laughs> wood. Wood. Yes. Is that enough? I Have I been? <laughs> Uh, Namaste Texas says Jesus he gets more knives in three weeks than I get in three months well some of this stuff has been in the works for a little while um, and you know but yeah still still I bought one knife and I was like sweet I got something to contribute for the next podcast yeah Man. well you know at least I won't run out of stuff to put on my channel that is true that is true so See, it works out well for my channel with all the steel testing because I can carry a knife for a month before I have to buy another one. This is true. This is true. Now, to be honest, you surprised me buying the military. Yeah. Because like I thought you were on like like this high end kick uh, of all these like high end knives, maybe even high end production knives, and all of a sudden I see I just bought a spider called Military and Rex Forty Five. I was like, what the fuck, Alex? What's wrong with that, man? Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, now I gotta ask: Did you pay secondary market prices on that bad boy? I did. Yeah, I figured. I had no choice, man. It's discontinued. That's a sweet one, though. You're gonna I, like I, that one. I paid two hundred and five bucks. Oh, what? That's nothing. It's clean. It's got no corrosion on it. Um, the centering's eh, but um, the knife cl- clearly looks like it was either used to cut paper or nothing at all so yeah. I mean, those easily go for 300 bucks plus right now so you got a good yeah. deal yeah i figured i shopped around for a while and and those things out of all the rex 45 ones tended to be the hardest so like 66 67 so you gotta you get a hard fucking knife right there i i i, I like being hard jesus <laughs> <laughs> so if you use that thing you'll like it yeah yeah i'll probably end up using it a little bit I mean, and then don't forget, I I bought custom fi- carbon fiber shit for it, clip and everything. So yeah, it it's gonna it's gonna turn into a four hundred dollar knife easy. Would it be your knife if you didn't? <sighs> I don't know, man. I just you know what it is is I can't I I'm, I'm can't get used to those flat slab uh, 
scales from from paramilitaries and I I know they're really uncomfortable. I don't like them. I mean, I, you know, for at first I I didn't mind them, uh, but the the scales that I put from Aramis on my PM2 are all contoured. They they're so nice. So I and he makes another one he calls the Swift pattern, which is contoured as well for the military. And then I have those uh, micarta python scales on my uh, other one, my para three. But I think I'm gonna get rid of those and get some. Um, he makes a silver twill. Yeah. So I'm thinking about putting some silver twill scales on the. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. I'm that's, wasting. That'd be cool. Yeah. Um. Before we continue any farther, I'd like to mention to anyone watching in the Twitch chat, I added a, a donation button down below the stream. Uh, it's like right by the logo of our big, big ass knife from the Sharp Talk logo. Um, you guys can't donate straight through Twitch because you have to be a Twitch partner to do that. Um, but this would be donated straight to a PayPal. So anything that you guys would donate would obviously go right back to the podcast and improving the quality of that. You know, getting mics, maybe extra cameras, that kind of thing, making everything better. So if you guys want to, it's there. If not, doesn't hurt our feelings whatsoever. <laughs> I think uh, Tom's gonna contribute that mus money to um, to uh, Knob Creek and some hookers. Hey, I'm down for both. All right. Specifically the Knob Creek, though. That'd be. I'm almost out of my bottle. Yes, the Knob Creek, and then uh, a little knob job. <laughs> Cater to Tom, guys. Let's let's donate some. Uh, yes. Let's donate some whiskey and girls to Tom. <laughs> um, the other thing that is, Alex, we got asked, what is our knife of the year that came out this year? Oh, knife of the year. It's not hard for me to answer this one, man. What's that? I'm going to say the Shirogorov Neon Zero. That is a good one. I haven't handled it yet, though, so I wouldn't know. I've I've been very close to buying it on a couple occasions. I found one like brand new in the box for six hundred the other day. Oh yeah. Yeah, and I almost bought it, but I was like, you know what? It's not worth it for me right now. In all honesty, if you spent six hundred dollars on that knife, you wouldn't regret it. Oh, absolutely not. I know it's that for a fact. Bad knife. Um, that's tough. I think for me, it honestly, it's such a lame answer, but uh, Benchmade Super Freak. Okay. I, I think that's such just such an excellent knife for the money, honestly. It, it's not a lame answer. I've seen a lot of people rave about that knife. You um, guys almost made me want to buy one. I got to change mine up a little bit. I, my reground one, um, I figured out through some use, it's not the most comfortable. Um, like way back in this portion of the handle, it gets kind of flat and blocky back there. So I'm actually going to take it off and round over the corners of the scales. And... Uh, hopefully make that a little bit nicer. But, I mean, I've already modded the shit out of it. What's sanding the scales a little bit, you know? Nothing at all. Exactly. Yeah. yeah Paul yeah. asked if I like it better than the Anthem. I, I do. Um, he also asked if I sold the knives I posted. I did. All three of them are now gone. So, that was the Anthem, the Sage 2, and that uh, Freak. I was actually selling the Freak for a buddy. He got a good deal on it. And I told him he could make a little bit of money if he sold it. So I helped him out. Uh, nice. He got them for a hundred dollars each at, at our local Dick Sporting Goods. He bought two of them. A hundred bucks each on on uh, Thanksgiving night. And he called wow. me and he goes, "Do you want one?" And I told him, "Yeah, I'll grab another one." And then I was like, "You know what? You can make some money on this. I, don't let me buy it for a hundred dollars if you could make fifty bucks on it." Right, 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 so, right. Wow. Yeah, he got a good deal. That is a good deal. So I, I still have one more. I'm thinking about selling. My little ProTech SBR. I really don't carry it much anymore, but I haven't decided if I want to sell it yet or not. Yeah. But uh, any other questions for us, guys? If not, I think Alex has knives for us to go into here in a second. We'll give you guys a minute to see if you uh, want to ask anything before we get into the knives of discussion. Absolutely. There really hasn't been much out for uh, that's piqued my interest, Alex. Uh, has there been much that has piqued your interest to buy? Ah, uh, not really, man. I mean, I tried to pick a couple here, 
I think there was maybe two or three of them on my six knives that I picked to talk about that are kind of interesting, but nothing I would actually buy myself. Mm-hmm. Just because I got so many projects and stuff going on, um, there is maybe one of them that I'm kind of interested in. I'm not sure if I'm buying one or not yet. Um, and when we get into it, I'll uh, yeah. I'll talk about that knife. Yeah, I'm gonna see if you maybe you have one or two of the ones that I was that have kind of piqued my interest lately. Yeah, we'll see if they're on the list. All right. I'm ready to get into that if you are. Uh, Alex or, or uh, Max asked to what you're drinking, and I told him in the comments that you're drinking Knob Creek. Yes. My favorite What's shit. Up, Max? <laughs> hey, did you see my Instagram post today? Uh, I, I did a, uh, a spoof uh, off of Max. I filmed myself driving, listening to music. <laughs> <Did you> really? <laughs> I didn't even notice that. Uh, I deleted it already, but. That's I funny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Paul asked, "How's the Rat Two modding going?" So I actually just ordered mine. It should be here tomorrow. So yeah. I'm gonna make it kind of ugly. Nice. Steve said he's done with his. Nice. So so we'll see what Steve's looks like. That's gonna be the one I'm most afraid of, honestly. Yeah. I feel like it's Steve could totally have fuck have one up. Spike, spikes in the handle. <laughs> I told him it has to be functional. Yeah. It can't it can't hurt us. All right. We'll see, though. All right. I'm ready to get into to these knives my, if you are. Mine's going to be stocked with, like, a custom edge by Alex. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, all right. All right. So, all right, Tom, let's go ahead and get your computer up. All right. And the first knife I'm going to talk about is it's a James Brand knife. The James Brand Carter. I don't know if you're too old for this, but every time I see the Carter, it reminds me of Lil Wayne. <laughs> no, I know what that is. <laughs> oh, look, 10% on your first order. So I thought this knife, you know, James Brand has been out for quite a while i remember years ago looking at their knives you know and they were never really anything that i would buy they were like hipster knives you know i still feel that way about them yeah i kind of do too but this knife i thought was actually fairly cool it's got the right blade profile it looks like it's got a comfortable handle mm-hmm um i'm not sure if that's supposed to be an axis lock or what that is See what Look at that calling it. deep carry clip. A slide lock cool. mechanism, so it has to be somewhat like the the access lock. That's what I kind of figured it was, but it's actually really cool. I mean, the clip on it is very nice, simple. Um, you know, just overall, it's a clean aesthetic, and you know, I remember like back in the days, some of their knives were actually quite expensive uh, for what they were, but. 160 bucks, I think, is just in the right ballpark for that. I think it's a little pricey for a VG10, but um, I don't know if it's you know well done at that price point. As long as it's well done, I think that's fair. Yeah. I don't know. It looks really good. Like it's just a clean, simple design. Yeah, I really I like, like the green thumb stud. Yeah, that's cool. Different. Yeah, they always have, like, green on their knives, I've noticed. It's, like, their thing, you know. Did you have the one? Yeah, the you really... could be cut, cutting an avocado, man. This is the one I saw the other day. The Clovis. I don't know if you saw this yeah. one. I, I, I'm looking at it now. What is that, a button lock? It is. Or is that the same thing? It's a button lock. They have the black one with the green thumb stud or the all stone washed. But the thing that kills me is the price point on this. So you get S35VN, uh, titanium, everything else. And it's like $450, which is crazy. So it's on bearings. There's the button lock with the little spring, the little pins. Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, yeah, that's a lot of money. It's made by Millet. 
Um, is that who makes it for him? Yeah. If you if you ask me at four hundred fifty dollars and S thirty five VN, I'm just gonna get a Chris Reeve. Oh yeah, all day long. I think it was something like that. Either four hundred or four fifty, starting at three ninety nine, so four hundred dollars. It looks like a pretty small knife too. Uh, two point nine inch blade, six point yeah. nine overall. Yeah, yeah, that's. Um, and you know what I think it is? Is it's probably because the knife. If they're making it out of millet, um, it's probably a knife that costs them a lot of money to manufacture. Oh, yeah. Because they're probably going to do in fairly small runs. I don't think they're going to make that in a huge run, you know? Now, I do kind of got to kind of appreciate that they're a company making it with U.S. manufacturing because a lot of these other companies are going to like Riot and Wii using oh, similar, yeah, the easy way to go. similar materials and you're getting up around 300 325 so I guess right. 399 isn't a stretch to have it made in the US instead right but at the same time that I that's still Chris Reeve money to me yep I did I just didn't know if you saw that one or not I, I just found that the other day I did not see that one yet it's interesting but, uh, very interesting what we got next so next one let's talk about the urban series baby barlow i had a question here in the chat about do you have any edge damage on your freight ground so thin it's about ten thousand ten thousandths behind the edge uh i was cleaning geese with my rear ground chef yesterday and it was not a pretty edge afterwards so it's kind of funny that you say that because I'm still working through some things, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, put anybody on blast about it because I, I specified what I wanted it at, um, but I'm working through it a little bit, seeing if maybe it was some burnt steel, possibly still from the factory. Because Brian is very careful when he regrinds, and um, he actually still left like part of my factory edge there, so he took no blade height off of it. So there's a possibility that it's burnt still a little bit from the factory but i have had i'm three edges in now and i i do get deformation kind of quick um steve did warn me that m4 doesn't have crazy high edge stability uh, like uh, rex 45 does because you can't take it quite as hard but i have noticed some light edge deformation stuff that you can't strop out and uh it still cuts well because it's leaning on geometry at that point but um it's something i'm working through and I'll, i'll do a video on it here in the future if it continues to be an issue. Hope that answers your question. So we got the, is this the one you were looking for, Alex? This uh, yep, urban that's series? The one. That is it. It is very so, cool. So this is an interesting little knife because I do remember it being a lot more expensive when it first got released, I think almost a year ago, when it was an exclusive thing. It was almost a hundred bucks more. I want to say it was close to 300. Really? Now it's at 220, which I think I think it's closer to where it should be. This is a very tiny tiny little knife. Now, I know a lot of makers will tell you that the size of the knife doesn't indicate the price so much because the same level of details can go into a small knife as a big knife. Um but, I mean, it's cool, but it, it's so tiny, man. I mean, a couple of hundred bucks. I mean, I bought my Rex 45 paramilitary, too, for less than that. Yeah, I don't know. I've never been a big fan of this uh, for the price. It's a cool design, but it's kind of a novelty to me. Yeah, like 120 bucks, maybe I would do it. Yeah. And especially now that I see that Fox is making them for him, I'm a little less intrigued, too. Right. I don't know. Yeah. It's cool. They got some cool options here, though. Different inlays, it looks like. You can get, like, the G10 different color inlays in it. And now Blade HQ's got these, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. And at first, it was supposed to only be an exclusive to these guys. Um, but I thought it was kind of a neat knife. Um, one thing I'm a big fan of is the blade shape. It's really cool. It's got a uh, nice classic like uh slip joint clip point bowie style yep or 
buoy, Bowie, whatever you want to call it. And it even has like a little like tiny fuller on it. So I like the little details to it. Um, no sharpening choil, you know, cool little pivot, nice little compact knife. It'd be nice to just keep something like this in your coin pocket, but um, to me, it just doesn't have a whole lot of purpose. Yeah, I agree. That's like a, a novelty, like collecting just to collect it kind of kind of knife. Right, right. Nice and compact, though. It is cool. It's it, it you know it might suit somebody, um, but I thought it, it look M three ninety super steel. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Get out of here with that. Uh, so, uh, but I thought it was a notable mention. You know, something interesting to look at. Yeah, I've been seeing them a lot more lately too. Popping up on my Instagram a lot. Yeah. All right. So, um, what we got next? We'll move, we'll move on to the next one. So now the next one we're going to look at is something that I think is really exciting because I'm a big fan of uh, Ian Pekarski mm -hmm. from EMF Metalworks. It's kind of funny because Paul just said the exact same fucking thing in the chat. I think I know exactly where you're going with this. Yes. So let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, CMF Alliance Design Conquest. He said the Alliance Design Bangerang. Bangerang? Yes, that, that's a different one. So that is the CMF uh, collaboration with uh, Alliance Design. Oh, yeah, I'll just pull up a picture of it. Whoops. So if you guys know anything about Ian, Ian is very hard to get a knife made by him. Um, nearly impossible. He, he doesn't do books anymore. Um, he's just too busy. He's doing just a lot of lotto stuff uh, on his uh, Facebook and Instagram groups. And his knives sell for a lot of money. Uh, most of the time, I think the cheapest one I've seen a lot of go for is probably about twelve, thirteen hundred bucks, and they can go all the way up to three, four grand. Yep. Um, he recently did one in in carbo quartz with fourteen karat gold pivot and backspacer and liners. So I really like Ian because he's he's playing with gold now. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen like a lot of makers do that. Uh, but for some of us that decided that, you know, maybe uh, that's too too high end for us, uh, he did make this conquest uh, and gave the design out to Alliance Design, which is really kind of intriguing to me. Yeah, and the thing I like about this is that it's an exclusive to Alliance Designs. It's not, um, you know, one of his customs that they're just making. This is like a one-off design for this. Yep, that's exactly what it is. And I don't know if you remember, but a while back, um, I had dinner with Ian when he came out to California. I remember that. And at that time, he was already talking to me about this knife. Very so cool. it's been in the works for quite a while. And he wanted to make sure that it was going to be a knife that not only functions well, but Ian's main focus is to try to get the lightest knife possible for the materials that he uses. He's really focusing on weight a lot. Um, so it's kind of, uh, it's cool to see. And you can tell by him like designing all the little holes, you know, to lighten up the titanium. Um, they're not just pockets. He straight had all the holes milled out on the knife. And it's got the Ian Pekarski look. I mean, you look at the blade, it, it definitely looks like a CMF design. Absolutely. That's the first thing I thought of when I saw this. I was like, yep, that's classic uh, classic CMF. Yeah. I like his so, designs a lot. It, although they might not be the most practical, he has like his own style about things, and I really like it. He really does. So um, little uh, spoiler alert, I, 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 I'm – going to be probably building something with him in february so that should be pretty cool that'll be sick hell yeah yeah so paul said so. the handle is too long on this it does look a little long for the blade it may be a little bit long but um better than too short 
<laughs> That's exactly what I was gonna say. Better than too uh, better a long handle than too short of a handle. And you gotta realize, guys, Ian's a big guy. So if he models a knife after his hand, um, that probably fits him pretty well. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but but I do like the knife quite a bit. Is there any way to see how much that knife costs? I think the rumored price was three twenty five. Pretty sure. See if you can find it in there. I'd still like to know who does all the production stuff for Alliance Design. As far as I know, it's just not—it's not just one person. It's a multitude of people. Here's the bang ring, Alex. Yeah, yeah, the, that's the the Christensen design. Yeah, what a great name, by the way. Yeah. But um, as far as what, what I've heard, it's not like one per or one manufacturer. Like Riot makes one piece for it. Or, could be the blade, could be the handles, I'm not sure. And I think it's the blade. Um, and then they have somebody else make the handle scales for it. And all the hardware. I think all the hardware is React stuff too. But it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me if that they're piecing it out then. It kind of doesn't. But, you know, I mean, they, they have. I'm sure they have their own reason why they do what they do. What about if you click on exclusives? Is it going to be there? Uh, Paul just said Reddit said the conquest price point was three fifty. Three fifty? Yep. I think I remember Ian saying it was gonna be in the three hundred dollar range somewhere. Did you see the sale that these uh angry stubby baby bears were on sale for on Blade HQ on Black Friday? No. I almost grabbed one. They're like two twenty five. Really? But it wasn't like it wasn't one of these. It was one of the, the more basic ones. But for two twenty five I was like, Oh my god. That's pretty good. Yeah. I wanted one. But the bangerang is a good note, too. Um, uh, Matthew Christensen is a pretty uh, awesome custom knife maker. He's on my list of knife, knife makers to work with, too. Cool design, too. I really like that. Yeah, very cool design. The thump, I don't know. He's the same Switch. one that, that collaborated with CKF to do uh, um, the uh, the spec the Spectra. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so it's got that same kind of esque to it as the Spectra and a couple of them. Man, I don't know. That's a great looking knife. Those sold out really fast. Yeah, I figured they would. Oh yeah. What you got next? Next one is the uh, so go to uh, knife center. And let's go to Aaron Fredericks. I, I really like to highlight this guy because the freaking custom knives this guy makes. So there it is right there, the, the center one with the red uh, micarta. Look at look at how much knife you get for 400 bucks. <laughs> it's incredible, man. Like, I mean, this is a custom knife for 400 bucks. Rounded spine. Yep. Red micarta. Oh my god, he's got the little forty-five degree bolster cut. Yep. Look, the uh, lock bar relief is on the inside. That's yep. something I'm big on. It's a great touch. I love his. He does this on all of them, but I love the little milled channels down the the handle. Yep. Nice flipper tab. Nice clean design. And I really like the blade, man. You could tell it's. It's, Dude, that's actually kind of different. Like, it's a drop point, but at the same time, it's like a different type of drop point. Yeah. Like, I don't, I can't remember too many knives that have like this straight of a spine going all the way down to. Yeah, it's really quite cool. And then you know, I mean, I know some people would bitch about the little tiny screws that are going along the, uh, like neck. You see the one next to the pivot. Yeah. On the holding the bolsters. <clears throat> And holding the, uh, yeah, exactly. I think that's actually really cool. It keeps it relatively low profile. And 
not like big old screws everywhere. That kind of reminds me of the South African makers. A little bit. They do the same type of thing. Yeah. Well, he so, does all this stuff by hand. He he doesn't have a CNC. He everything's fitted by hand. Yep. And very cool, man. I mean, a red micarta is a nice touch with the bronze. He, he put that knife together really well. The clip is kind of basic, but if you look at the same time, I like how he has like the little hints of red. Yep. In with the bronze just to match the micarta, and I think that's really, really cool. Yeah. Man, if, I, cool. if I didn't want to find one of those uh, uh, Chebrikov uh, toucans in Vanax again, I might grab one of these. Uh, I think they're getting another toucan in Vanex in 2020. That's what I saw. I'm going to have to jump on it when it comes in. Yep. Not if I jump on it first. Yeah, I know. I went to buy it the one day and it was gone. You messed up, Tom. I could have bought it and sold it to you. You could have. You would have sold it to me for double what I paid, though. <laughs> I could have totally bought it. I should have bought it that episode. That almost looks like a better version of a CQC7. It's absolutely going to be a better version. <laughs> You're right. That's a cool grind, too. Look at look at the weird grind he's got going for that Tonto. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. So, you guys, if you're looking to get your feet wet in the custom knife market, you want to try something, I highly recommend checking out Aaron Fredericks. Um, it's very affordable for a full custom knife, and I hear the, the quality is pretty damn good. And we know for a fact that the warranty is excellent. I'm not a Tonto guy, but this is really making me want one. This is actually a really cool Tonto. It's such a weird design, and it, I like how there's there's a lot of beef out here at the tip still. Yeah. But it doesn't show it in the grind. Like a normal Tonto, the line comes up right here, where it yep. still stays thin all throughout the primary grind. That just looks really good. I'm just really digging that handle. That handle's really nicely shaped. Man. There might be some more knives for sale. I, I kind of want this one. How much is it? Three fifty. Three fifty. Yeah. Wow. This one's a little smaller too. It's a three and a quarter. Three and a quarter is perfect, though. Yeah, that's that's like perfect size. Yeah. Damn. Oh, he's impressive. Such an impressive maker. Yep. All right, what do we got next here? So you can stay on the knife center. Uh, let's look at Brad Zinker. custom trapper so I've seen this guy around forever me too but, you know and he's done some collaborations with Boker he's done some with uh, drop um, pretty I, I don't know you know I mean it, I, I've played with the idea of buying one of his customs once in a while yeah um, I, for some reason, never end up doing it. <laughs> but, but it is kind of interesting. I will say he's got his own unique style. What do you think? I don't know why his style has just never stood out to me. Like, I appreciate the designs and everything. It's just not what I like. So back out of this one, Tom, the, the one knife that kind of made me uh, look at him today, see that bottom one? That's got a bolster on it. That one. That was the first knife that I'm like, holy crap, that's actually pretty damn good looking. So he's using the, this is uh, from Fat Carbon. This is the copper or brass um, snake skin carbon fiber. Yep. And then you did the bolsters out of Damascus. So this knife I actually would carry quite a bit. I think it's pretty cool. That looks and great. Really I like that boomerang kind of pattern on the uh, the Damascus that he used. It's kind of weird because from the thumbnail picture when we were out, it just I, I didn't notice it was Damascus. I just saw the boomerang pattern. Right. Like the big dark spots here, but now that you are actually looking at it, that's so cool. It's very cool. I like that a lot. That That is a nice Brad Zinker. That is sweet. I like the gold liners. I just think that knife was really well done altogether. You know, with the brass carbon fiber, 
it matches really well the way he did it. Yeah, absolutely. The pocket clip looks like it's functional, you know. It's got a pretty good amount of space. Look at the centering. You can see the centering, too, is pretty perfect. damn perfect on it. So, um, but again, that's almost a thousand bucks. It's a lot of money for that knife. Absolutely. Maybe too much for me. <laughs> So, but an honorable mention, considering his other stuff is, uh, you know, it's cool, but you know, it's n it's never quite done it for me. That's kind of neat. That it's different. Started. It's like a big cleaver. Yeah. It's like his trapper pattern, but like as a cleaver. Go to the next picture. Oh. <laughs> See the back of it. It's cool carbon fiber. Yeah, that's different. Yeah, I've never seen, seen carbon fiber like that. Or is that it's micarta? Like, is it micarta? They call it blue gold twill. Oh, it's twill. Hmm. Interesting. That's good looking. Yeah, definitely. All right, how many more we got? Uh, we have one more. Okay. Last but not least, the Shirogorov Hatian Zero. It's finally out. I don't know if they have it here, but you can try. Nope, not yet. Let's see here. I already saw pictures of this, but it's uh, very impressive. It's very cool. So we knew this thing was coming out for a while, uh, but it is finally out. And it's basically a Neon Zero in a Hatian configuration. The titanium one was uh, MSRP. Well, no. Uh, let's say the sale price was about seven fifteen. dollars This one's 700 So it's actually even just a little bit cheaper. That's not bad. I I really like the design of it um, from when I carried that one Hatian light. Right. I, I don't like the blue pivot on this one. Well, that's just a sticker, Tom. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's uh, that's a sticker that covers it when they're brand new. Really, I did they're, not know that. Yeah, they they it's got a um, uh, the standard flathead looking thing on there, just like all the other ones. You just learned me a little bit. Now, if you look on the uh, the lock side, it's pretty cool because the old Hotties didn't have this, but then this one actually has carbon fiber on the. Uh, lock side too which i thought was a really nice touch yeah i like that i like that a lot more than um the one that i had in hand what yeah what did the one that i had it was just kind of like milled pockets wasn't it I can't yeah remember. it just has milled pockets but it's it's got like a uh, like the older neons had a um like a little uh cnc machining kind of lines on the back of the uh yeah you know. Like the neon retro now? Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I've also had a good chance to jump on a couple of the old neon uh, ultralights recently. I saw one yeah. the other day for like 425 Yes, that would be a good buy, Tom. I want I one in S90V, though. I don't think you'd be disappointed. S90V or uh, Van X 37 Yeah. I don't want one with S30V. Yeah. Agreed there. Yeah, I dig that. Good looking knife. I dig it too, man. Very cool I knife. I figured you would. It's a Russian knife, so. Yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> as much as I, you know, everybody says I'm like a Russian knife guy, I, I I, think I'm more of a fan of the South African knife makers than even the Russian ones. But I do like Russian knives quite a bit. No lie there. I like the new jipping yeah. style they're going to, by the way. Yeah. It looks really, really clean. Yep. Love it. And you can tell, like, even from that picture you were at right there, if you look at the tip of the, the blade, how it's just tucked away barely in the spacer, like, they really maximize the amount of um, space that they – they utilize all the blade that they can for that size of a knife, which is really cool. That's exactly what I look for in a knife. I, I don't want something with a huge-ass handle with a, with a tiny little blade. I, I want something like that that's going to be as close to one-to-one -one as I can get. Yeah, and you can tell they really uh, 
did the best they could on that, which is really cool. Yeah, I like that a lot. That so. reminds me of, uh, have you ever seen the tip pictures of the Russian Hokkaido when they did that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How they have like, it, like this piece here at the very back, the little backspacer comes in yeah. super far, almost just to like, for them to like flex on everybody of how good they could get their centering. Oh yeah, my uh, my Shirogorov uh, Sigma, mm -hmm. my at the Sinkovich uh, collaborations kind of got something similar going on too. I always thought that that was just them like swinging their dick, like, "Hey, look what we can do." Oh, absolutely, it is. There's no purpose for it other than that. Absolutely, and I think it's really cool. Yeah, I'm absolutely. all for it. I'm, I'm with you there. So, and that is all the knives, Tom. Awesome. Well, I had one or two. All right, let's do it. Whoops. Wow. So I've kind of been getting into Hogue knives recently. Like I, I've, we've carried them at the store that I work at for a while. And um, I was very impressed with them. Are we going to look at the DECA? We are. I am extremely impressed with this new DECA. So I've seen a few videos where people are, are reviewing them already and call them bug out killers. Yes. What do you think? I'd have to see one in hand. Um, just from looking at the materials and the design for me personally, I have this, I, I would say that this would be a bug out killer for me. I like this blade style a lot more than um, the bug out myself. It's got a very less George type blade to me with the, right. I don't know, just the way that the jimping extends down here and then swoops down into the swedge. That's a right. very less George thing. Um, as well as um, better steel, 20 CV instead of S30V. More secure or more sturdy handle material, G10 instead of uh, the Grivery or FRN or whatever they're going to call it. Right. And I mean, that's that's their G Mascus right there, right? Yes. I think this was a Blade, H Blade HQ exclusive, the black and blue. Um, but on top of that, it's only like a quarter of an ounce heavier, half an ounce heavier. And if you notice a quarter or a half an ounce in your pocket, or you say you do, you're lying because there's, there's, I can carry a four ounce knife and I can carry a two ounce knife. And I, I really can't tell the difference between the two. Right. right the only right. knock I have against this knife is all the damn screws up and down it. Yes. That's the only thing I was going to say. It's got so many screws. Like it is unreal. So just on this one side, I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on one side. Yeah. Now two are for the pocket clip filler tab. So I, I don't really want to knock it too much for that. But the other ones here in the body. I think man, it could have done without like three of them. I, I see the three we hit back here in the back that are for your barrel spacers. Right. I don't really think you needed this one in the back probably with your lanyard tube there. Or no. no there's not a lanyard so. tube. Never mind. If they put a lanyard tube in there, they wouldn't need that. Um, and I'm assuming these two here in the middle are for the liners. Most likely. They almost but have the, to be. You could you could have had the liners screwed from the inside, not from the outside. You that know? or do what uh, Benchmade does, and they only have partial liners running to just a little bit back here. Right. And just have one screw there. Right, right. Now, is this thing a full steel liner? I th like from top to bottom? I'm not totally sure. See, that would be interesting. I'm not totally if sure. It's not, if it is, then it's it's already going to kind of be a little bit more durable than a bug out right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah, if it's full steel liners at that weight, that's that's awesome. I really do like this knife. I actually, it's caught my eye before. I don't know if you're totally familiar with with how good Hogue has been with our steel testing stuff. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. they're they're awesome, yeah. and they're it's it's just been very very impressive the way that they've dealt with everything and their heat treating stuff for twenty CV seems to come out consistently at around sixty one ish. Yeah. Um, and although it's not where we, as a community, would quite want it. It's better than what a lot of other companies are doing, so. Right. right. And they're a very small batch company, so they make they they pay attention to all this kind of stuff. Right. So I'm very I'm very happy with that. And when this black and blue one comes back in stock, I might pick one up. Yeah, I mean, 
hundred and forty bucks is not bad. Oh, yeah, man. I forgot to mention that it was. It's only twenty dollars more than a bug out. Yeah, I think it's a lot more knife too. Absolutely. All right, the last one I had. You guys are gonna hate me because as much as I hate hinder, this one has caught my eye. Oh, you know what? Me too. <laughs> the, the brand new USA May Blade exclusive warning the after one with the the warning. Oh, that just does That's something cool. for me. It is really cool, man. It's very cool. The angle of the blade, like the cutting edge going upwards, mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. Now, the the hinderer, as far as what I'm as as far as I'm concerned, hinderer does the warney the best as far as their blade shapes go. Absolutely, because they they just make a mean, nasty looking warn cliff. They make a nice slicer too. They do. But what I liked about this is the warning, even though you have the flipper tab down here with the angle of it, when you go to tilt it up, you can still get the full flat edge on a cutting surface. That's why See, they I, did that. I saw one of these for sale a few days ago um, on Instagram, and I was like, wait, what the hell? Is that a fucking regrind, or what the hell is that? I, I never know. seen that before. That's looks, really cool. It just looks mean. It's 20 CV. Oh, yeah. That's what they've pretty much moved to. Um, man, the little harpoon action they got going up top. It just It's just a really good looking knife. I've always liked the half track. We had a half track in the shop for, for a while, one of the Gen 1s, and it was a very impressive knife. For, for being a small knife, it feels really, really good. I'm assuming this thing's like 425 bucks. Yeah, 425 just like the other ones. And since it's a USA made blade knife, you can get it anode whatever color you pretty much want for free. They do a lot of different uh, anodization here. The stars and stripes one's pretty cool. Yeah, I was going to say that one, that American flag one's pretty rad. Yeah, they do. They do an excellent job. And uh, uh, Witty over there is such a good dude. He, he does a live stream once or twice a week on his Instagram, and that's always a good one to watch. Yeah. Um, I also forgot to mention when we were looking at the Hogue, there is a, a Warncliffe version of that Hogue Deca coming as well. Oh, cool. Uh, I think it was Slicey Dicey last night. Just put up a video on it. It's a little legit, like, first look of it. And um, it's not a normal Warncliffe. Oh, see see in this picture how you can get the full flat edge on the, on the table? Yeah, I see that right there. That's, that is cool. Ugh perfect but the uh i don't know if they if hogue has it up on their site yet and they put a fuller on it yes <laughs> gotta get the blood, blood groove the blood groove i don't know if hogue put it up on their their site yet the new warning doesn't look they do they don't have any pictures of it because slicey dicey was saying that he bought it sight unseen off their site because it, I, I don't know he thought it was going to be just a normal warning but it's not it's their uh, compound grind interesting which was like oh where we got here the X5 they do a compound like this oh yeah 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 and it looked really good on that knife I don't I don't love it on this the X5 but I really really liked it on the Deca it looked really good very cool that's pretty much all I got for, for my two knives. So, all right, those are two that have really piqued my interest in a in a very boring market lately. <laughs> yes, I think that's the first thing we. Do you feel like the knife uh, scene's been getting stale lately? Absolutely. There's not enough variations of like unique variations of everything. There's so much titanium. There's so much S35VN. Um, too many flippers. Um, I don't know, man. There's just so much of the same stuff just rehashed over and over and over again that it feels like you're getting the same knife with like one or two small tweaks for fifty dollars more. Right. Over right. and over again. And I mean, that's one of the reasons why I stay in the custom realm is because that's the only place where I feel like I can get something that is different, you know, yeah. than 
all this stuff. But, I mean, I still like production knives quite a bit, and I'm still planning to buy production knives. Um, but I've been feeling lately, and I've been seeing, like, the way the knife groups have been going on Facebook and Instagram. It just feels like there's been a lot of kind of uh, – lack of excitement out there you know yeah. uh custom knife makers are still going crazy and strong though um but you know it's not for everybody and even me i've been going pretty hard this year but i'm getting to the point where i'm getting tired of blowing so much money on knives you know Definitely. so i think it's going to change here give it give it a month and we'll be at shot show time so we'll have new knives coming out um and we'll have plenty of time to talk about that when all those come out. I'm excited for that. I feel like that's going to be a long episode. Yep. yep. Um, I don't know. I, I just think there's so much, there's not enough new stuff, like unique new stuff. Yeah. Did you, I, see, did you see the quiet carry drift? I have not. Because that one got me excited. It's uh, all titanium. The lock bar insert is LC 200 N. Oh, that's weird. And the steel is Vanax. Wow. He treated by Peters at, it was either 60 or 61. I can't remember. 61 is like the cap for Vanax. You can only go to 61. Um, so it's a completely stain-proof knife. Oh, wire pocket clip, by the way. Um, How much is the knife? 300, I think. Wow. Which isn't crazy. Not for Vanex. For for Vanex and, and full titanium, and it was light. Wow. I was really excited for that. That's the first one in a while that's like been totally different. Like it's a really good overall like utilitarian shape and everything, but right. I don't know. Just seeing Vanex in a production knife makes me excited. That is pretty cool. So, uh, I I think uh, the steel craze is just kind of. It's gotten to a point where everybody's gotten everything, you know? There's nothing new coming out that's... Uh, I think there's an answer for everything, you know? For stainless steels, for super hard steels, for... You know, I mean, I remember when I was first started collecting, you know, in 2012-13. Um, I mean, M390 was the holy crap stuff, you know? Yeah. It was like you had to pay premium for the knife and the steel. It's like a double charge just to have M390. And now, you know, you can get like that bare knuckle I bought for in 20 CV was 100 bucks. Yep, I was going to say like the giant mouse Ace Iona for 100 bucks. Right. For M390. So, I don't know. I mean,. <laughs> It's uh, it's quite a crazy knife market. The way that it's gone in the last like eight or eight years or so, it's it's wild. It's almost so oversaturated now that it becomes less exciting. Right. Because anything that you're looking for could be there. There's no suspense for a drop anymore. Or right. Even like for me personally, when I'm looking for a new knife, I'm looking for something that's different, not necessarily in. Um, I don't know, the overall design category. I'd like something with a, with a nice usable blade shape right, and, and a good steel, something different than what I've already tried. Right. That, that's right. where I'm at. I like to try all the different steels now and that's about it. And, um, you probably noticed like a lot of the stuff I've been doing lately is a lot of knives that have been, I'm taking my old knives and getting them pimped out. Yeah. And that's kind of the reason why, like there's nothing, you know, on the market where I'm like, oh, wow, that's freaking cool. I got to have this. There is one that I'm kind of excited about. I think I'm going to end up buying it is the uh, – if I can get to the the purchase on time is the new Atom by Three Rivers Manufacturing. I have a blue carbon fiber one coming out. So I might do that because every – and this is a knife that I'm purely buying because of the hype. Yeah. I literally – the knife on its own did absolutely nothing for me. I'm, I look at it. I'm like, okay, that looks like a very functional, nice knife. But nothing of it about it said, oh, there's, there's something to that knife that I don't have in my knife box. 
yeah. that I need to have it, you know, but I want to see what this hype is all about. So I'm going to see if maybe I, uh, I can join this next drop that's coming out soon and pick up one of those knives and see what that's all about. For 200 bucks, I figure I can flip it if I need to. It's funny because I feel like I'm different than you in that, right? Like you look for something different that you don't already have. I, yeah. look, I look for something that even if I might already have it, it might fill another role for me. Like I, I find like a use for it in my life, like whether it be something in a super stainless steel. So if I go fishing, I have something that I can take with me because I sure as fucking taken Maximet or K390 or something with me fishing because something's going to get messed up while I'm out there. Right. Um, and uh, Namaste Texas said when I was listing out my qualifications with the – you know, good blade shape, you know, nice handle, ergonomics, good steel and everything. And he said, and a good grind, God damn it. And that is absolutely where I'm at. Because if I, do, if I don't, if a knife looks thick behind the edge and I, and I don't know anybody that hasn't, you know, that have mic'd it up to see what it's at, I don't buy it. Because I don't want to have to spend another $45, $50 to have it reground. Right. You know. But in case you do, there's always Brian. There is always Brian. <laughs> and he'll do a great job. He can fix anything. Yes, he can. He can also wreck anything, as I've seen with his little beak knife and, and everything else. Oh, yeah. All right. So I, I wrote down a few topics I thought we'd finish up our episode with and discuss. So I thought you and I both do YouTube channels. Now, when I look at your YouTube channel, I... I'm literally extremely impressed. You have like micro pictures of the edge. I mean, your your YouTube channel is so intricate and so well put together. It's cool. Like there's no, there's absolutely no surprise to me why you got so high in the contest. I appreciate that. No, and I totally mean it. Um, and when you and I first started talking about doing a podcast, you know, one of the first things I did was go to your channel and check it out. I'm like, holy crap, this this guy's got a lot more to offer than I do when it comes <laughs> to a lot of the technical side of things. I may know the collection aspect of it, but, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you really get into. It's really cool. Now, I do, like, a different style of channel. I do, like, a knife tour, right? Like, yeah. we take a knife. We're going to break this thing apart. We're going to talk about the blades, the grinds, the aesthetics, kind of maybe where the maker came from so you get an idea of where your knife is coming from. And then I just kind of ended it off with like some highlights about the knife and some gripes, you know, maybe something I would change about the knife. Yeah. So my mine's very simple. You know, tons of people do it the way I do, tabletop review style. Yeah. But there might be people listening out there that might want to make their own YouTube channel. So I thought you and I would talk a little bit about you being the intricate YouTube channel maker and me being the half-ass YouTube channel no. maker. No, you make some badass videos too. You, you go super in-depth on, on your uh, on the knives that are in your collection. You, you go way more in-depth than what a lot of the other uh, you know bigger reviewers do. When they're putting out – they're doing quantity over quality I feel a lot of times – where you're doing the opposite. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, I, I I remember back in the days when I first started doing knife collecting, I would look at a lot of YouTube uh, videos to see a little bit more about the knife. And there are some of those YouTubers out there that would make me fucking order the knife that night. You know, like, okay, I'm, I got in my cart, but now I'm hitting buy now. You know, like, so I wanted to be one of those guys that say, you know, that shows everything that highlights all the things about the knife. And I may not talk about it, but when I'm showing the knife, you might see little angles and things that might, you know, either deter you from buying it or maybe make you want to buy it. Yeah. Um, I've had actually like three or four people email me saying they're buying a neon zero because of me, <laughs> which was a huge compliment because, you know, I mean, I, I, God, that video is like, I think my most popular is the Neon Zero review. And then the, uh, I had a guy reach out and ask me a lot of questions about the Scout and said, after looking at my video, he's going to order a Trippercoff Scout. 
So, you know, every once in a while, it seems like we get we get to be one of those influential people. And I want to make sure I do it the right way. Absolutely. But there's a lot of people out there that say, you know what? You guys look like you're having fun. I want to be one of those guys and do reviews. And um, so why don't you tell a little bit about your process, Tom? Like, what do you what do you use? What oh, kind boy. of equipment? How long does it take you? That's a good one. Um, hmm. So... First off, I tr I've tried to come up with ideas that, um, you know, would be intriguing to, to other people. Not necessarily always myself, but to a, to a wider audience. You know what I mean? Like, there's certain topics that I've wanted to look into myself, but they might not be interesting to, to everybody else. Okay. Um, but first off, I try and come up with a good topic. Um, I think more recently, I'm really into, like, the long-term stuff, the long-term carry, the long-term use seems to be a lot of guys are really interested in that instead of just I cut three boxes with this S90V knife and it did great so it's a great steal. Um, right. Instead, you know, it's like four, five, six sharpenings later. This is what it did after each sharpening, that kind of thing. But I've kind of been going more along that route. Um, and I, I've, I'm kind of of the mindset right now that I'm trying not – I used to try and upload twice a week when I first was really getting into it. And at that point, I've realized, or now I've realized that that's really not feasible for what I'm doing. If I want to put more effort into my videos, I try and only put out one a week, one every two weeks or so. Uh, and even then, I'm still getting a little bit burnt out on it. But uh, I want to post again here soon. I, I might post tomorrow. Anyhow, getting off topic a little bit. So that's kind of what I do. I try and find a good topic. Then I go through with any of my testing. Um, I've tried to keep everything pretty much to the same parameters. So it's harder for people to say this performed this way because you did this differently, that kind of thing. Um, that's kind of how I'm focusing on is more testing. I do do the tabletop reviews here and there. Uh, but I try not to do that a whole lot because there's so many people out there now doing those that I want to, I want to do something a little different. You know what I mean? Right. And that's why I've kind of, I don't know if you've noticed, if you've watched the last couple of videos of mine where I did the steel testing, I did like a mini review of the knife inside the steel testing. Yeah. So people are still getting that if they want to see it, but I don't know. That way I don't have to spend a, b a bunch of time on that because that's not right. me. That's not something I'm super interested in. Um, but generally what I do is I, I write notes for my video. It might not be, you know, 100% scripted, just topic or points that I want to hit. And then right. I kind of expand upon that in the video. I do the same thing, actually. I always have like a little bullet point sheet yeah. of paper. Otherwise, you, you, you either forget priority. things or um, you start saying things that don't really matter. And you got to edit stuff out later. And I don't know. It just keeps everything super simple that way. Um, I try not to get too in-depth with everything. Try and keep it relatively simple for people to understand. Um, right. Because, I mean, most guys out there, I'm not going to say that I know a ton about this kind of stuff. I know enough, but I'm not like Triple B, where he knows all the different carbide types and all that kind of stuff. Um, as far as the gear I really use, um, I just use my phone to record all the tabletop stuff. Um, Galaxy S10 uh, Plus, I think. Um, just got to record it in HD. HD, 1080p or, or 4K, depending on you know, what your computer can handle when you're trying to edit it. If you edit, uh, Steve, Gerald, they don't really edit much. <laughs> Me neither. Or, I don't are, you? <laughs> are you just a one take dude? Yeah, I'm the one take guy. Oh, I can't do that. Um, yeah. So I, I, I record with my phone for that kind of stuff. I have a nice little overhead mount that I can, that holds my phone for me. It only costs me like 20 bucks or so on Amazon. A lot of, and a lot of times you don't have to spend a fortune on this kind of stuff to, to be able to have, you know, decent production value, you know, right. You don't got to spend three, four, five hundred $500 on a nice camera. Um, I used to be into photography a bunch, so I do have a nice camera for recording, uh, other footage if I want to, it's got a really nice microphone and everything on it. Uh, if you look at my, some of my real early videos, that's what I used. And that's why the audio quality and the video quality is a little bit better. But it doesn't autofocus as quick as my ca as my phone camera, which is why I went back to my phone camera. Right. Um, I just got two LED lights 
for for lighting for the video and i'm still trying to figure out a good balance with those lighting is huge lighting yeah. is massive you you can have as the best camera that you you could possibly buy and if you're lighting shit the video is gonna look like shit yeah that's something i would invest in if you're just looking to get into this one of the first things is lighting um i agree with that yeah or even even if you don't want to buy lighting record it outside during the daylight right um maybe not on like you know a, a blue skies day maybe like slightly overcast is like perfect right um as far as when i'm done recording my video and everything i put it into my computer um i edit it on uh i have uh, cyberlink power director I, I paid like 40 50 bucks for the program it does an excellent job you don't gotta buy um adobe whatever or the sony vegas or any of the you know programs that cost you four or five hundred dollars you're not making a movie here you're making youtube video for you know a thousand two thousand people maybe right um, people don't really care for they don't care about your production value as long as it's acceptable you know what i mean right don't be like steve and record it straight up and down record horizontally <laughs> so, yeah. That, yeah, that's I'm, another one I, I uh i do horizontal myself you have to do horizontal yeah. have to um i don't know you just got to kind of find your own niche as far as this stuff goes good thumbnails are are a good uh you, you need good thumbnails have to yeah. yeah um i do all my own i know some guys have like little apps that make them i do all my own in like a photoshop type program it, that's what I do, but I mean, mine are all my knives on top of the knife box. Yep. Once you get it down, it, it takes you. It takes me, you know, twenty seconds to make a quick thumbnail anymore. As and as far as that goes, just good titles. Uh, make a full description. Make sure that you're writing a description. Don't leave it blank, because right. if you're trying to grow your YouTube channel, you need to have a description in there because uh, the YouTube algorithm picks up on the description. It pulls more info out of that than it does the tags that you put in. Really, yes. I didn't know that. Actually. So you have to be you have to be doing that. Um, tags are also important. Yeah, I know you got that cool program that helps you. Uh, I do figure out good tags. I, I do. It, it'll kind of like auto complete tags for me based on searches. Um, that's helped a lot, honestly. Um, that's really all there is to it. Just you know, and on top of that, just be consistent. If you decide that you're going to post once a week, post once a week. If you're going to post once a month, post once a month. Don't be like Steve and post one, you know, twice in one week and then silent for three weeks. You know, it's, right. it's if people know when your videos are coming out, they're more likely to come back to your channel and look for it. I agree. And I think the most important part is finding a community and getting involved in that community because being by myself, I, w I wouldn't have grown very much, but getting involved with Steve and Gerald and all these other guys and them shouting me out has been huge. Yeah. Just oh, like I remember I remember the day I got shouted out by Advanced Knife Bro. Yeah. And I had like instant like 20 followers and I had like 60 on Instagram. It was wild just in one day. Like, so that's a big one. That's case in point is BJ. Yep. BJ doesn't have like top notch production value, I wouldn't say. He does everything in one take. He's just, you know, a boy from Virginia making videos about knives outside, throwing knives at stumps, beating the shit out of his knives, and just kind of uploads to it. And because he was involved with a good community on top of making good, you know, quality videos, I think the dude's at 400 subscribers plus now. Yeah, he already beat me. It's crazy. <laughs> That's what I told him. I'm like, dude, you're gonna catch me, and you've been doing it for a quarter of the time that I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he surpassed me already. He's killing it. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's kind of my thoughts on it. I don't know if I went too in depth or was kind of rambling all over the place about it, but no, that was good, man. That's pretty much where I'm at with it. My whole thing is so I I unfortunately am lazier than most, and that's probably because I got a a, a daughter I got to raise and. I have to put her to sleep. Like I don't have a whole lot of time. And if you guys realize like a lot of times 
like on all my videos, my voice is usually really low. I've had comments about it, except recently, since I got this microphone, I got a lot more, a uh, little bit better audio. I took it a step at a time, but I make everything on my phone, literally from the editing, which is not much, just adding an intro and outro to it. Um, as far as making the intros and outros, I made those on a couple of apps I got on the App Store. I literally signed up for a free trial for three days, made my uh, intro and outro that night, and deleted the app so I didn't have to pay for anything. <laughs> and I kept them, you know? Um, and they're the same things that I use. I always say, take the same picture of the same angle for my knives so you can kind of see the same arrangement with my channel now. Um, and mine's very basic. It's not as cool as Tom's. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's literally the laziest, lazy fuck way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky I had to buy a damn microphone. You're lucky I did that. <laughs> so I ended up getting, uh, my wife got like this big table for the dining area. And, um, so now what I, I did, I used to do a tripod with my phone, but now I do a, uh, I bought one of those gooseneck um, holders for the phone. Yep. I kind of clamp onto uh, uh, the table. And um, the way I do my videos, I sit there, I look at the knife, I play with it in my hand, I flick it open, close it, flick it open, close it, look at it around, and I'm just doing my own tour of the, the knife. And then I kind of go, I do have a, a, a list of kind of structured things that I like to talk about, like choils, plunge grinds, jimping, blade length, overall specs, you know, like I do my own kind of like simple thing. But let me tell you guys, with one piece of paper, a pen, and a cell phone, I do my whole YouTube channel. And it probably shows because it's lame, but. Um, I think your production value is really good for what you got. Yeah, I mean, that's all I do. It looks great. It, it's okay. I mean, what, I'm at like 365 subscribers, and I'm not big in the community. Like, I don't I don't talk much to people. I kind of keep to my own, except for, like, a few, select few. So I kind of let the natural, like, the natural progression come out, out of the channel. And it's kind of weird because it's funny. It's cool because I'm just getting – random strangers running into the channel and you know i think i'm getting like close when i average it almost like one subscriber to one and a half subscribers a day on my channel that's good that's good so, growth so and it's pretty consistent um i'm posting at least once a week i'm trying to anyways sometimes i do it twice a week i just did a video on a custom slip joint which was pretty cool talk a little bit about the evolution of slip joints and stuff like that um so but if you guys want to do a channel I, I highly suggest you go out there and do it um i thought about doing a youtube channel i collected my knives based on starting a youtube channel two years three years four years prior to me even doing one guys uh, it's only since I've joined the podcast that these guys finally pushed me over the edge to like just go ahead and do it already, and um, it's really not that hard. So if you guys no. want to get into that, I highly suggest it. It's it's kind of funny. I, I did have a couple more points here. Um, I've I've been doing YouTube since I was shit, like twelve or thirteen years old. I've always made YouTube videos. Those long those old channels are long gone. So please don't anybody try and find them because those are gone, deleted out of my memory <laughs> there is one out there that doesn't have any association with my name that nobody's ever going to find uh from me and a couple high school buddies and we had a lot of fun doing it when we when we played golf back in uh on the high school team but that was the first place where i found a little bit of success we only had like 100 subs but we thought that was a huge thing back then you know and uh but anyhow there there, there was a couple good points in the comments um paul said there's too many people sucking knife manufacturer dicks talking about every knife is amazing and that's a good point. Just kind of be objective with everything. Talk, you know, if you, there's something you don't like about a knife, bring it up. Don't sugarcoat it just to maybe get knives sent your way by that manufacturer later. You know what I mean? Right. right. 
I mean, if you're objective about it and you say, as Nick Shabazz says, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right. The good, the great, the bad, and the ugly. Look at him. He, he says bad things about knife companies all the time, and he gets sent knives. So people will be more likely to uh, tune into your stuff if they know you're giving them your honest opinion on, on everything that you're reviewing. Well, it's tough on my channel because everything that I, I – I usually review is stuff I like. Yes, you, you, you only review the good shit. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But I have, I have, uh, I have a few knives that I have had some some gripes about. Yeah. So I, I agree with that a hundred percent. Be true to like how you feel about what you're buying. Think about it as like if your brother, sister, your best friend is about to pick up, go spend their money to buy that pocket knife. Are they really going to like it or, you know, try to be truthful about how you deliver the message. And honestly, it might work out in your favor because I, I hate to bring it up again, but the Hinderer video that I did, right? But I, I said so many good points about Hinderer and then I had the one or two little bad things about it that were off the status quo from every other Hinderer Gen 6 uh, video. And then that video blew up because yeah, of it, that. It sure did. So I, I got a lot of dislikes because of that video. But at the same time, <laughs> hey, all press is good press, you know? Right. Um, and the other thing is don't do it expecting free knives. Don't do it expecting, you know, money, anything like that. Just do it because you enjoy it. Yep. I agree with that. Because if you're doing it for, for free knives and stuff, trust me, I haven't gotten a single free knife here. Not one bit. Alex hasn't gotten a free knife from anybody. Nope. I don't think any of us in our little – community i guess have gotten actually i did get a discount on a knife which i'm not going to disclose who because he said he liked my review on another <laughs> <laughs> i haven't been so lucky i get a i get a rick hinderer upcharge um the only person i've ever you know had some sort of business relationship with that i get things for for low cost or free would be brian honestly. <laughs> and that's mainly for testing yeah, Brian. Brian's hooking us up. Yeah, uh, Brian. Brian's the I homie. Like, I almost feel like Brian's like part of the podcast in some weird background way. Ooh, I forgot to mention. Uh, I don't care if this takes away some of our podcast, but him and a couple other guys from the Reddit Discord started their own podcast called uh, Behind the Edge. Nice. And it is excellent. Such a good podcast. So I will check that out. You guys should totally check it out if you guys want to listen to Brian. And there's a couple other guys on there with some really insightful uh, takes on everything going on in the knife community. Very, very cool. I hope they get some extra viewership from that. Yep. All right, Alex, we got another topic to hop on to. Uh, Namaste Texas asked if you have used your KME yet. My what? Your My KME? KME? Yep. Yeah, I've used it. I've used it quite a few times actually already. I've scratched a few blades using it. It's very no. easy to do. Not taping it up enough, you know. Not taping it up. Do you have the little stopper that stops it from going too far up on the blade? Uh, no, I don't. That was a big accessory for me. Yeah. When I had mine, it'll stop it. Like you can set it so the uh, stone can't run up past the the edge. Oh, I like that. It's only like I'll four or five bucks. It. Totally get it if you're if you're ever sharpening any of your nicer knives. Send me a link for one of those when we get off. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, it, it does uh, do quite an excellent job. I, I like the KME quite a bit. Uh, actually, surprisingly, guys, I've been doing a lot of uh, freehand sharpening, believe it or not. Look at you. Yeah, I've been uh, using uh, some some cheaper stones, like Arkansas stones and stuff like that. Um, but it's pretty wild. I've been getting a good, consistent edge. Um, on uh, quite a few knives, so I've been doing a lot of freehand stuff and enjoying it. You're you're doing better than me because I still hate freehand sharpening, even though I got a really good edge on that crew wear the one day. Yeah. Um, it broke down super fast, way faster than what it would on the Wicked Edge. I'm like, well, I fucking suck at this. So back to the Wicked Edge. Well, the first knife I did it on was a gas station knife. My cashier at work had has a pocket knife in case. You know, somebody goes and wants to yeah. try to rape her or whatever. She's got this knife in her purse. Yeah. Uh, and then she gave it to me, and the shit wouldn't even, like, I could literally put, like, 20 pounds of pressure on my palm with the edge, and this thing wouldn't cut. Like, <laughs> it, it was so dull. Like, 
and it never been resharpened. She's had it for a few years. So I'm like, well, perfect. I'm like, what if I scratch it? She's like, I don't care. I'm like, okay. Huh. So then I bought like an Arkansas stone from, that I bought years ago from home. I have other nicer stones, but you know, I can't do a wet stone at work while I'm sitting hanging out at my desk. So I brought this Arkansas stone and started just kind of like going at it and holy crap, man, this thing was popping hairs by the time I was done. Um, I don't know if I Michael Christie did, you know, like where it's hair whittling sharp, but <laughs> but it, it would shave hair like no problem. Uh, it was pretty cool. So I got to try it on some maybe more premium steels and just see what happens. Yeah, premium steels, it's, it's no different than sharpening the low-end stuff. It just takes a little longer most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll get there one day. <laughs> uh, Bama, or, or Lee, he, he goes, tell Alex I'm here because he doesn't activate comments and he's a gay jarhead because of it. Wait, what? He says... Tell Alex I'm here because he doesn't activate comments and he's a gay jarhead because of it. Oh my god. Gay jarhead. Here we go. <laughs> there, first of all, Lee, there's no such thing as a gay jarhead. <laughs> yeah, we, we weed those out in boot camp already. So, uh, But the jarhead comment is a compliment, so thank you very much. <laughs> he says he needs to get back on the podcast. I, I'm down to have Lee back. Yeah, you can come back, Lee, I guess. I actually had another guy hit me up on Instagram today who wants the Neves on. Ooh, that'd be a good one, too. So I told him I'd think about that, too. Absolutely. You know, that would be another guest that we haven't had on. Those two are cool. The Neves. Yeah. Dude, Jared gets so excited about Knives, man. They both he, do. Funny. Oh, my God, man. So, like... Like uh, Acuminous Edge, uh, which is my coworker, had sent him a, like a couple SOCOMs, a custom and a production one. And the excitement of Jared wanting to cut the fucking paper with that custom, me and Acuminous Edge were sitting there on the, the work computer. We were watching the video of them too, like unveiling it and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, dude, he's going to cut stuff with your custom. He's like, no, nah, he's not. <laughs> yes, he is, man. Look at that smile. He's about to do it. So, I mean, like, the it, the excitement those two bring out on YouTube is pretty fun. Uh, I don't watch them as nearly as enough as I should. But It's, it's funny because he has the same excitement, whether it's a $20 Ganzo or a custom. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't yeah, I, I noticed that. But they're pretty funny. They're a cool couple. Yeah. I like the knees. Uh, Lee says you're a bitch, but he loves you. And you tell him fuck you. He, Lee, can, he can hear I, you. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Fuck you, Lee. But I love you too. <laughs> All right, what do we got next? Another one, another channel that's like gone like way up there, dude. Bama's passed me too. Has he really? Yeah, Bama's have, got a lot of followers. We're gonna have to like start a scandal or something about him. Knock him down a peg or two. Yeah, I, I think we're gonna have to like do like. Uh, like some kind of uh, scandal or something. We're gonna we're gonna leak your nudes, Lee. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> All right. We got another so, topic we want to hit. Yeah, I got a couple more. Um, so, I thought obviously you know it's December. It's probably a good time to kind of see. What do you think are some good gift ideas, man? Oh man. I know we're probably not going to go hit very long on this one. Uh, buying a pocket knife for people is not, you know, always what everybody wants for Christmas. Yeah. I know it is what I want for Christmas. You know what's funny? Let's take the knife part away from it. And let's just get things that guys or girls wouldn't buy for themselves uh, as far as relating to, pot, to, to knives. Let's talk about, like, I'm talking about sharpening equipment. Because I don't know okay. if, if you're if you're similar to me, but I'd rather buy another knife than more sharpening stones. Okay. Um, you know, any sort of uh, oil, lube, that kind of thing. Well, KY Jelly always works really well. Yep, I knew that, that he was going there. Kind of figured. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, 
Because that's yeah, the thing I, mean, I always hate. Even though it's like ten dollars, I never want to buy it. You know, like the Benchmade Lube, the the KPF, all that stuff. If you if there's any girls, which I highly doubt. But if there's any girls listening, you know, those little stocking stuffers, guys will really like. Uh, lubricant for their knives, nano oil. You know, if you want to go baller, you spend 15, 20 bucks on nano oil. Uh, your knife loving boyfriend will love that. You hear me, Lee? Your knife boyfriend will love that, okay? <laughs> By the way, he uh, said, my nudes will boost my channel hard. This Bama hog. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Uh um, the other thing is, Weha drivers. Oh yes, Weha drivers for for any any knife guy. I think he'll flip. Yep, Weha drivers are a big thing, um, and nothing but Weha because yep. that's usually don't go for the 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 freaking uh, Harbor Freight version or anything like that. We want the Weha. Yep, the Weha shit's the best. I, that's been it the was. best investment I've ever made. Me too. Me too. I even got I'm us a set at work so I can I can tear down customers' knives if I need to. Nice. Nice. I got tired of actually I literally I had, we had like a little bench made kit there. And I literally snapped like three bits because they were they were over hardened, I guess, and you go to like torque on a screw and just pop. And then oh, yeah. you look down and like half the bits in the screw. I had that bench made kit for a while. It it, it did the same thing to me actually. <laughs> Uh, Bama says, my knife boyfriend, you mean your boss, Alex? Yes, that's exactly who I know, um, I mean. Uh, <laughs> Cumin of Edge. Yes. <laughs> hey, do you do, do you still have his fucking customs he that said, he sent you from yeah. like, I don't know when? <laughs> it was a couple comments ago, but he says, I still have some of his customs. Yeah, like, so, so a Cuminous Edge bought a uh, knife from my buddy at DLT Trading from Jason. And Jason gave Acuminous Edge a good deal, but Acuminous Edge did not want to pay, like, the tax or whatever it was. So he had the knife sent to Bama. Bama was supposed to check out the knife and then send it to Acuminous Edge. But I don't think he ever sent it. Like, I think that <laughs> it's still there. It's the, the abalone uh, inlay. Oh, yeah. So I think that thing's been fucking sitting there at Bama's for <laughs> since he bought it. <laughs> Listen, I don't know how y'all can hold on to people's knives for like months at a time. If I have a knife for more than like a week, I start to feel really bad. Right. I don't know how Steve's had them for like a year and people are still okay with that. I'd be pissed. Yeah, at this point. Well, you know, that's funny because another one of my new old acquisitions, I could say. So like almost three years ago, uh, there used to be this custom... He, he's a knife pimper. Uh, he goes by D-Law Customs. His name is Daniel Lawson. He's a cool dude. Um, he's a buddy of mine who lives kind of locally. And he used to be really popular for regrinding and customizing. What's that uh, Spider-Co, Chanko collaboration that they had? The, the fucking cleaver, the little mini cleaver that Spider-Co did. Oh, the... Um... What was that thing called? Oh, shit. I know the, the. You remember though, the, right? The Rock. The Rock. That's what he was. So he was. He he was like he wouldn't modify anything or like kind of uh, pimp out anything you gave him. And he worked on some really expensive knives too. But his his little niche was uh, customizing rocks. So he literally has been MIA from like the knife community for the past like three years. Because of work, the kid, like all this stuff. Yep. So about almost three years ago, I gave him my rock. I gave him some custom, like, it was like some uh, toxic green C-Tech material and and some other stuff to make a rock for me. I customized my shit. And he finally, finally came on his Facebook group today and said he's going to start working on knives again. So I guess I might finally get my rock back. There you go. But three years that guy's been holding my knife. I'd be pissed, bro. Ah, uh, you know, like I just, I, I just let him hang on to it because his rock mods are that good, man. Wait till you see it. It better be good, Alex. Oh, it's gonna be good. You'll see. You'll I swear see. to God, if it comes back with like 
Dremel mods on the uh, on the scales, just like the rock pattern. That's he does it. rock pattern shit, I but it's not done. He does a nice job with it. Uh, Bama said your boss said not to send them till after Christmas because the mail is busy and he gets worried about them losing it. Well, yeah, but a cumulus edge sent them to you like in what June? <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> this has been a while. I don't even think a cumulus edge cares. Uh, I, I'm just messing with you, Bama. Uh, but yeah. So. But Christmas gift ideas, guys. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to be much help. I thought I'd be a good topic, but I have a hard time with this topic with my own wife. We got what, one more topic to hit here, Alex? Yep. Cool. All right. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is... Uh, so proper maintenance and what's an overkill? That's so a, honestly, guys, I know you guys see those and they take their knives apart into a million pieces and then they show you everything and then they put the fucking oil on the little bearings and they put the knife back together real carefully. So I'll tell you the truth about me. I literally will not take a knife apart unless there's a problem. If I get the knife out of the box and it functions, it's sharp, it's good to go, I don't touch it until I have a problem. And I think people overkill on the uh, oil and maintenance. What do you think, Tom? I'm with you right there. Um, I'm so tired of everyone disassembling everything after I carried it for two weeks and it's got some pocket lint in it now, so I got to clean it out. It's yeah. just, yeah. I don't know. I'm at the point now where as long as it's still opening and closing okay without any major hiccups in that, I'm leaving right. it go. Yep. And most of the time you don't got to tear it down either. Just get a thing of canned air and blow it out and normally you're good to go. Yeah, so like the same stuff that you blow out like the uh, the laptop uh, keyboard with, Yep. that stuff works great. Yeah, I um, use it at work all the time. I mean, the Medford, I can't even take apart because it's pri uh, proprietary. So I just blast the thing with uh, WD-40, like he recommends. Blow it out, wipe it all out, and it's good to go. And that's only because I've had that knife for like, I don't know, three, four years. Yeah. So guys, stop taking your damn knives apart for no reason at all. No. Seriously. Stop it. Now, I do kind of like taking it apart sometimes brand new from the factory to see, one, to see what's in there. Yeah, of Because I'm curious. And two, to clean out, like, the factory goo. But don't go on YouTube and saying that you're doing knife maintenance when the damn knife doesn't need maintenance in the first place. We're looking at you, Shabazz. <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. His, his videos are a great tool, honestly. They really are. And that's why he does them. Yeah. Yeah, but even even knife makers have told Shabazz the same thing. I remember he did the uh, the disassembly on the Olamic Busker, his old Busker that he had mm -hmm. uh, before he got it stolen or lost or whatever. Yeah, and uh, he even mentioned in the video that Eugene was already like, "What are you doing, taking this thing apart already?" You know, <laughs> like <laughs> it's a week old. <laughs> Bama says, fuck Greg Medford. I took mine apart because he said not to. You ain't even my real dad, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, Medford is Medford. And you did you hear about that whole thing about people taking those things apart and finding, like, tons of washers in them? Uh-uh. Oh, yeah. There's a thing going on right now about Medfords and, like, more than two washers. Oh, like because their tolerances were off, so they just throw a couple extra yeah. washers in to... Yes, yes. <laughs> so that's the thing right now with Medford uh, out in the community. There's a little drama going on about that. Still centered better than Benchmade's. Yeah. I mean, however you do it, I guess. I guess. <laughs> you do you. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. I don't buy Medford personally, but... Uh... I mean, as long as they're getting the centered blades that are smooth, I don't really, I don't really think it really matters, right? 
Nah, I guess it doesn't. I mean, functionally speaking, it shouldn't. Oh. But it is kind of bullshit that you paid that much for a knife. And it's not, like, built, you know, two washers, good tolerances. Yeah. I mean, the your typical Medford's at least 800 bucks, right? No, they got some good models now down around 500 bucks or so. Yeah. Not, I guess if not you're looking for like, if you're looking for, sure. for the classics like the Praetorians, yeah, you're not anything less than 800. Yeah, my 3V back in the day was like my Praetorian G 3V was I think like 785 or 750. Yeah, they're pricey. Isn't that cool? So, I don't know. So as far as maintenance is concerned, guys, I mean, I I mean the only time I like to take a knife apart and really get in there and oil it is if it's a uh, blade that corrodes very easily, you know, like 1095 steel, yes. like high carbon steels, stuff like that. And you happen to, you know, wash your knife out after you use it for something under the sink. And you still technically don't have to take it apart. I kind of do because when they sit in my box forever, they, they tend to collect a little bit of moisture in there. So a lot of times I'll over lubricate it just to kind of keep a nice thick, you know, coating on there while they sit in the box. Um, but if it's a knife you carry every day, literally like a drop or two on the pivot is all you really need. Yep. And there's a lot of custom knife makers out there that actually urge you to not put any oil on their bearings, uh, that they say bearings run better dry. So... I mean, that's subjective, but, you know, that's just something to keep in mind. Um, as far as but knife maintenance, guys, don't take it too seriously. You know, don't overdo it because the more you take your knife apart back and forth, you know, the more you start stripping screws or doing whatnot. Yep. Sometimes you might do more harm than you need to to your knife. Especially on the production shit. The, the screws aren't meant to be taken apart over and over and over and over again. Yep. Unless you're talking Chris Reeve. Exactly. Or Hinderer or some somebody like that. Right. Where they make their screws in same tolerances instead of like Spyderco or Benchmade where they source screws probably from the cheapest Chinese manufacturer and uh, kind of go about it from there. Yeah. I've, scri I've stripped out more Spyderco screws than I, I'd like to admit. Yeah, I've stripped a few myself. It's really frustrating. Yep. I agree there. Oh. Do we have any anything else, Alex, or is that pretty much it for us today? That's pretty much it. We were missing both Gerald and Steve this episode. Um, so hopefully you guys enjoyed just me and Alex kind of going back and forth here. I think for just having us two, it went pretty damn smooth. Yeah. We didn't really run out of too much shit to talk about. Um, nope. Not quite as many viewers as we had last time. That's tended to be expected with, uh, you know, pretty much a month hiatus between episodes. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thank you. I forgot to talk about the Honey Badger, the 8CR13 MOV carry. Oh, yes. How's that go? So I didn't last two weeks. I lasted about a week. Um, it's good 8CR. And for my use, I already I had to sharpen it three times in that one week. And yeah, I, I and honestly, I let it go for longer than I normally would because I didn't want to resharpen it. And it just so happened that that week happened to fall on uh, Black Friday. Right. And we had like this giant like pallet of like bulk ammo. And oh, so people would like grab a box or two out of the case. And then the box would be empty. So I'd have to break down the box. And then the next box down, I'd have to cut the flaps off. So it was open for more customers, right? Right. And um, so that knife got a lot of use Black Friday weekend and, and such. And I let it go for way longer than it, than it should have. It wouldn't even touch paper by the time I was done with it. Like, wouldn't bite, wouldn't wouldn't do anything. And, yeah, I'm uh, sure. Let's just say I'm never going to do it again. Because... <laughs> <laughs> I need something for, for what I personally do. I need something better than 8CR. I need, damn it, VG10 or better. And even VG10 shit for what I do. Yeah. Um, no, I'm not going to use a utility knife, Paul. I enjoy my, my nice premium folders 
using them for boxes because... Paul has a point. I know. I know he has a point, but it's not as fun. Yeah, because you could take the blade out and put a new blade in. And... Then what What purpose would I have for this hobby? I don't collect them to... I don't collect them for the same reason you do. I collect them to use them and beat the shit out of them and do whatever. And I don't know. True. The honey badger True. is very nice, though, I, I have to say. Uh, Jack Farmboy sent that to me free of charge, which is awesome of Jack, and, and I really appreciate it. Um, I might end up either giving that knife away or auctioning it off for the pass round testing project. Um, I got four or five knives I want to do that with here soon and just get pretty much as much money out of them as possible to go towards that project. Um, I don't know. The honey badger was very impressive for what are they like 20 bucks, 15, $20? Yeah. It flips great. The ergonomics were pretty damn good. The eight, I mean, it's 8CR, but it was well done 8CR. And, uh, I don't know. I think it was a little thick behind the edge, but I don't know. I kind of expected that. I was pretty impressed, honestly, except for the steel. <laughs> never doing 8CR carry again. I can, I can never do it. I'm sorry. I can't even last the full two weeks. I, what came in that I had to carry it? There was a knife that came in and I couldn't stand not carrying it, which is what made me stop. I don't remember. I still got to finish up ZDP too. The ACR experience took over the ZDP one. So I got to finish that up too. But anyhow, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I, I will have a video on a, on the ACR if you guys want to watch that when it comes out. That's going to be one of the next ones. I have one already done, ready to post tomorrow. I, got, I still got to get last episode of the podcast up on YouTube. This one will be out Monday, as always, on all the normal audio platforms. It'll be up on YouTube. Hopefully, by the time we record the next one, I'm so slow in putting the YouTube ones out. But I think that pretty much does it for us. Yep. So thank you guys for sticking around for uh, just Alex and I, and maybe next week we'll have, have a guest, maybe two. We'll, we'll see what, what we can get lined up. But uh, anyhow, guys, thanks so much for listening, and uh, have a great night. See you guys.